says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And Peter, in writing about this and recognizing that God is doing a work in us and we cooperate with him in that work, said, For this reason, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if you um, possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we come before you today and we want to honor you. We want to bear fruit in our lives. We want to see you work through us. And we want to be productive and fruitful for you. And we recognize, Lord, that your word here tells us that a part of that is developing uh, kindness like you have for us. And I pray today that you would simply help us in our uh, looking at your word today and what it means. And uh, Lord, that you would challenge us to step up and to step out for Jesus Christ today. Hide me behind the cross. Let everything be said that honors you and nothing else. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. This uh, passage starts off with this very reason, and it concludes with the idea of being fruitful and productive, and a part of that is uh, kindness and love, and the two go together. And in fact, as we're looking at the uh, fruit of the Spirit, you probably noticed well by now how that there is an overlap, that kindness and love go together, and kindness is oftentimes enabled by patience and self-control, and, and that there's so many things that go together, and that's why in Galatians 5, 22, it says the fruit singular is all of these different things. It's not fruits or you have some but not others, but it all comes together because they all come from God the Father through uh, His Spirit into our lives and then are represented. We uh, uh, reflect God's work in our life in one way is through kindness. Our kindness is uh, is not just something that uh, we develop or we come up with or, you know, according to certain customs or habits of uh, whatever culture we live in, but kindness really is learned from God and who God is and what God has done in our lives. And it starts with the kindness that He has shown us. We would know what kindness is if we didn't know the kindness that God has shown us. Uh, it is my uh, privilege, or was my privilege recently, to uh, interview the Miller family here in Belleville uh, a while back. Uh, little Nicole Miller received a kidney from her then uh, kindergarten teacher, uh, Wendy Killian. And many of you have seen that in, on WMFD or on one of the Cleveland news stations, or you read about it in the newspaper. And a lot of attention was focused uh, early on, on the teacher, Wendy Killian, who uh, was willing to give up a kidney for one of her students and made uh, national news, really. Uh, CNN and Fox both picked that up. MSNBC also showed a considerable amount of interest until they discovered that it was really a faith story and then they backed off from it. But it was my privilege because I knew the family. I had uh, Nicole's brother in school, and I, of course, knew Mrs. Killian, uh, having subbed for her, and knew her and her husband, Stu, who was recently uh, one of the commanders at the National Air Guard Base here in Mansfield. And so it was just a joy to be able to go and to talk with them about how it all came about, how God worked out the details, and how God raised up someone uh, to give this very kind gift. And Nicole's mother, Letitia, said to me uh, that in her reflection of this, she said, you know, it was an amazingly kind thing for a teacher to give one organ from her body to my daughter. But then it reminds me of how Jesus gave everything up at the cross for you and me. You know, talk about kindness. Yeah, it wasn't just one organ. He gave it all at the cross for us. The, the perfect Son of God dying for us. You know, you put kindness in that uh, perspective, it just kind of changes how we look at it. And, and that's what I want us to see. Kindness is more than we might uh, at, think at first. You just hear the word, you think, yeah, okay, kindness is doing something nice. 
It's being a gentle person, but it's more than that. It's deeper. There's a significant, serious side to kindness that God wants us to know, to understand and to develop in our lives and to reflect because uh, his kindness on the cross wasn't just doing a nice deed for us. Oh, it was much deeper and, and more significant than that. So today we want to talk about adding Jesus kindness to your life. You see in Second Peter, for this reason, make every effort, uh, which kind of indicates that we ought to apply ourselves to these things and add every effort to uh, uh, you make every effort to add to your faith, goodness, goodness, knowledge, knowledge, self-control, self-control, perseverance to perseverance, godliness to godliness, brotherly kindness. And then that capped off with love. You know, the elementary qualities of goodness and kindness are capped, or, or I'm sorry, goodness and knowledge are capped off with kindness and love. Well, what does the Bible mean by kindness? Uh, it's always uh, good to look. What does the Bible say about kindness? We see God's kindness to us. We say, in loving kindness, Jesus came. And he came to rescue us, to save us, because we were helpless. But what does it say uh, about us living in kindness. Well, first of all, we could see that it includes gentle behavior, caring for people. Uh, you know, these are things that, that are needed. We live in a very crass society. We live in a society that's rude, a society that's built on the put downs and the tear downs. So many of the programs that you see on TV today, these so-called reality shows, are all about uh, cheating somebody or uh, putting someone down or saying bad things about somebody or making fun of somebody. And uh, yet there's a, an elementary quality of kindness that is about gentle behavior, about caring for people. And something that went by the wayside some time ago and shouldn't have is, is manners. Uh, I don't know that schools teach manners much anymore. I'm not sure how many homes teach manners. But probably most of us were taught something about manners when we were growing up. And, and it's seemingly lost in our society. But as God's people, there ought to be some manners. And sweetness and consideration and helping others. Now, this particular part of kindness, uh, it resembles a human kindness. You know, seeing a need and caring for someone. Or to put it in biblical terms, it's loving those who love us, who um, can uh, return the favor to us. And this is admirable. I'm not putting this down. God wants us to live with this kind of uh, grace and compassion every day. These qualities, after all, resemble the Lord's compassion on the helpless. You know, the Bible says that Jesus saw the crowds. He saw that they were harassed and that they were helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he taught the word of God to them. And then uh, when needed, he fed them uh, because there were no other supplies around. Took care of the need. All of those things. Wonderful kindness. But there's a second side to this or a deeper side to this kindness. It's also loving our enemies. Turning away wrath with kind words. Doing good to those who are not good to us. Uh, doing good to those who are not uh, kind towards God even. And this runs um, contrary to human nature. It's the opposite of human nature, isn't it? I mean, we don't naturally love our enemy, do we? That's hard to come by. It's difficult. And most of us struggle at this point. I know that I do at times. You hear people lash out against God or lash out towards us. It's hard to respond in kindness to them. And yet God responded that way to us. While we were still enemies, while yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, loving those who don't love you back. And Jesus mentioned this was very important. This is distinctive. This is distinctive because this should be the measure of God's people. God wants us to live daily with this deeper, more significant kind of love. After all, he, this is what he taught in Luke 6, uh, verse 32. Luke 6, 32, as I turn there. Uh, Jesus said, if you love those who love you, and certainly we should, but he says, what credit is that to you? Even, quote unquote, sinners 
Love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be the sons of the Most High, because, verse 35, He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Wow. God is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. And if we're going to live like Jesus, if we're going to model Him in our lives, if we're going to reflect who Jesus is in our life, that tells me a very difficult truth, but a very important truth that we need to be kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. And that's hard sometimes. You know, I face that all through the ministry that I remember in college when uh, they would send some of us uh, ministerial students down to the rescue mission in downtown Phoenix and to uh, preach there these rescue missions. The idea is they would bring uh, homeless folks in off the street until they reached capacity. They closed the doors. They let someone preach the word to them that day and offer an invitation. And then they would provide uh, a simple meal. And one morning I was there preaching and uh, a gentleman came up to me and he was complaining about the bologna sandwich and the cup of coffee that that particular organization had provided that day. And so he talked about God's love and all we get is a bologna sandwich, you know. And it just kind of rose up in me and kind of bristled. And he was like, you know, you sound pretty ungrateful and think about you know this and think about that and, and how easy it would be to lash out at the ungrateful. And yet God is so kind to us. In our moments of ungratefulness, in our moments of failure, and how patient he is with us. And it's not about not saying anything, it's about how we say it, isn't it? Yeah. You see, kindness finds its roots in Christian love, assisted by patience. And we've talked about love and patience already, so that's why I mentioned that. But uh, without God's love at work in us, we couldn't love the unlovely. And it's very difficult to minister to a lost world because ministry is messy, particularly in times in which we live. Uh, people's lives, when they're broken and falling apart, it's not always pretty. Families are sometimes in a great deal of conflict. And, and to minister, to try to be kind, it, it takes love and it oftentimes takes a large degree of patience to be kind and to speak kindly. But these things are produced in us by God, the Holy Spirit, it says, the fruit of the Spirit. Not the fruit of our good works or our efforts or our education or something that we derive ourselves. That's what God does in us. Well, you ask the question, does God expect me to live this out? Of course, Jesus was kind. He's God's son. But does he expect me to live this out? Well, the Greek word for kindness is krestotes, or it could be pronounced christotes. Tender concern for others. And when I hear that word Christotes, uh, I often think of my beloved because she is very kind in uh, her spirit, gentle in her spirit, and kind towards others. But this word not only refers to that gentleness with which we uh, treat others, but Christotes also can be translated good character, doing the right thing. And so it's a gentleness, but it's also doing the right thing. The two concepts go together in the word that's translated in uh, the fruit of the Spirit as kindness. It's crestotes. It's, it's being gentle. It's being nice, but it's also doing the right thing. And those two, as we'll see, need to go together. It's, it's treating others graciously. It's having a tender heart. It's also desiring what is good, what is right, regardless of... Of the situation. That's the third part of the definition of crestotes. That it's being nice or gentle, it's doing the right thing, but it's doing it regardless of the situation. So whether uh, we're being treated well or not well, we're to act this way. And the Bible suggests we don't get the chance to pick and choose when to be kind, we're just to be kind. Because that's the way Jesus treated others, and he is my example. 
And he didn't treat just some people kindly. He treated everyone kindly. Uh, God is kind toward us. And praise God that he is. Because if he were not patient, if he were not full of mercy and grace, where would we be? He intends for us to be as compassionate and respectful towards others um, as he is towards us, regardless of who they are. You know, I did a word search this week on uh, respect and um, being worthy of respect. Every time the idea of worthy of respect is used, it's always on us. We're to be men and women who live our lives worthy of respect. Uh, we are to be uh, even masters or, or uh, those who employ others are to be masters worthy of respect. We're, uh, the Bible says older men even are to live lives worthy of respect. But when it comes to showing respect, God's people are to show respect to everyone. Proper respect. Uh, even in our witnessing, when we're telling other people about our faith, when we're warning people about an eternity that's coming, the Bible says in 1 Peter 3.15, we're to do this with gentleness and respect. And it, it describes a, a kindness with which we even warn those who are lost and undone. So since we're living as missionaries in pagan territory these days, we would do well to follow what the Bible says and win the respect of outsiders. We do that partially through our kindness. Now this is not saying that we go along with anything that's wrong or just uh, swallow anything that comes uh, down the line. Um, anything that's opposed to Jesus or his church. Jesus didn't act that way. In his kindness, Jesus didn't condone sin. He didn't put up with what was wrong or what was set up against God. He, he pointed it out. He illustrated it. His light revealed it, in fact. We learn that God hates sin, loves the sinner, but he treated people with kindness. You look at people who were desperately wicked in their lifestyles. Perhaps one of the worst was a man who was living among tombs. He had cut himself and was in horrible shape. And Jesus met him one day and the uh, demons who were living within him were so many, they simply referred to themselves as legion. There are hundreds of reasons why Jesus might have thought, well, this guy is a mess. This guy is broken. This guy is just beyond help, beyond repair. But that's not how Jesus acted. He loved the man and he set the man free. And that's what he wants to do. And we need to act that way. As well. Now, this is tough for us if we're honest. And I just really have been so convicted as I've gone through the uh, Fruit of the Spirit series of just areas of my life where God just wants to do work and where I need to grow. And, and really, this level of kindness is, is one of those areas. There is a point in which we struggle. And we struggle for at least three reasons, I believe. One is the false definition of love. We define love in our society as this warm, fuzzy, everybody get along, go along, whatever it is uh, kind of thing. You know, we are told as Christians that if uh, when society proposes things that are utterly wicked and depraved, if we are love, that we're just supposed to let them go along with it. But that isn't love. Love doesn't let people destroy themselves, their families, their lives, their livelihood, their nation and communities and so forth. That's a wrong definition of love. Uh, love includes doing the right thing, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Includes doing it the right way also. <laughs> the right thing the right way. Sometimes there has to be tough love, as we call it, where we are going to point out some things, but we do it in the right way. Uh, secondly, a reason why uh, this kindness is hard is uh, because something gets at you and it's hard to be kind. Uh, it's hard for me sometimes to be kind to those who oppose God's work. You know, there's two different kinds that oppose God's work. First of all, there are, there are those that, that seem to kind of weave their way into the life of the church and bring harm to the body of Christ. That bothers me. God has, uh, for reasons better known to him than to me, has appointed me as an under-shepherd. And I come to know the flock, and I love the flock, and I care about the flock. And when I see Satan's hand at work hurting the flock, that, that makes me angry. That bothers me. That upsets me. That gets to me. And sometimes it's hard to act with kindness when I see 
that attack. The other area is hard for me is when I look outside of the church and I see what's going on in our society and the blatant attacks against God and the, the misuse of his name and the uh, uh, our way that God's people are treated. That bothers me. But I still need kindness. After all, Jesus is kind to those who are ungrateful and wicked, the Bible says. And so I need to learn what kindness is. That it is standing up for what is right, that's how I do it. And to uh, have that love and that patience uh, with others who are lost and undone. Beth Moore adds to this that kindness, and what we'll look at next week, goodness, though, go together. She calls them complementary aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. And she says this, this is interesting. Uh, without kindness, goodness becomes harsh and self-righteous. That's true. A lot of legalistic thinking comes from doing what is good. But the kindness is absent, isn't it? She goes on and says, uh, without goodness, kindness becomes indulgent tolerance. There needs to be a balance, and only Holy Spirit helps us have that balance. That it's doing the right thing the right way. It's standing up for what is right, but doing in a way that honors God and can reach others who are ignorant, who are lost, who are rebellious, whatever the case is. Those who are ungrateful and wicked, to treat them with the mercy that God has treated us well. Hmm. God, however, put His here and now presence in us to help us. Where we find it difficult to love the unlovely. Where we find it almost impossible to be patient in uh, certain situations or with certain personalities. When we find it difficult to be kind. And as Paul said in Romans chapter 7, you know, the good I know I ought to do, I don't do. And the things I know I shouldn't do, I wind up doing anyway. When we find ourselves in those kinds of situations... When our best efforts have failed, the Spirit can and does help us. And thank God that He provides that help for us. I can't, but He can. I can't always be the patient, the kind, and the, the kind of person that I ought to be. But thank God that with His strength and His presence and His leadership and His help in my life, I can. Thank God that where I can't supply answers to problems, He can. I can't, but He can. Repeat that with me. I can't, but He can. There's a friend of mine who uh, suggests that Christians, when facing obstacles and problems and things that aren't going the way they think they ought to be, where they, they uh, sense that, you know, uh, we've been praying for things for a long time, we're not seeing uh, answers and so on, that we need to take a set of knee pads. And we need to write on one of them, I can't. And on the other one, he can. And put them on and get on our knees and get on our face before God and spend some time there until he provides what we need. Until he answers those prayers that we've been calling out. Because I can't. It's a letting go. And we're understanding that only he can because nothing is impossible for God. Amen. Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. God wants to give us that fullness of his presence and that power to display his kindness. So how do we develop a deeper, more significant kindness? Well, with God's help, because I can't, but he can. And with God's help, and I need his help at every step, these four steps. First of all, we need to die to self. Die to self. Kindness is the opposite of self-centeredness. You can't be self-centered and kind. The two do not work together. They're not compatible. Jesus always acted out of love for God, even when dealing with evil or false teachers or whatever. He was never selfish or self-serving. So connect with Him. Rely on God's help to deal with difficulties, difficult people, whatever the situation is, to be kind. He'll keep testing you until you learn it. I've discovered that. If you really want to repeat unpleasant tests... Just keep not doing the thing that God wants you to do. He'll just keep bringing it in, bringing it in. He's so patient. Oh, but when we finally learn it, then we can rely on his peace and we can face those things down. He'll take us on to the next step. Die to self. Secondly, be active with God's family. We cannot learn these things like we're supposed to learn them living in isolation. 
We cannot remove ourselves from the body of Christ, from the influence of fellow Christians, from the uh, study of God's word together, the preaching of God's word, and the worship of God's word together. We can't learn these things in isolation. God, who is community, Father, Son, and Spirit, created human beings as community. He looked at Adam and said, it's not good that man be alone. And he formed his people to be a community, first a nation in the Old Testament, then as the body of Christ, the church in the, these New Testament days. He put us in a body, not only to help build it through the use of the gifts that he has equipped us with, but also to grow and become more like Christ. Developing kindness is a part of that. We practice that here with each other where we have a safer environment, where we have an encouraging environment, where we have an environment based on the truth. When you can do kindness here, you stand a far better chance of doing it when faced with adversity, don't you? You learn those things here in the body of Christ. We need to be active with God's family. Third, we need to trust God to provide grace. When you wind up in that time of stress or pressure, a time of hurt or adversity, any extreme circumstance, whatever it might be, depend on God to provide for you. You know, sometimes it's good to just uh, close your eyes, count to ten, and um, while you're counting, you just start praying, Lord, help me. Because I know the words that want to come out that do not honor you. And Lord, help me to have the right words to speak in this situation. We learn that together, but then we practice that. And, and we can, even in witness, even when people become um, un, or act ungrateful or wickedly, we can learn to treat them with the kindness that God has treated us with. And that includes, you know, pointing out certain things that they need to hear that they might not want to, but do it in the right way. Fourth, submit to God. Yield to God, to His ways. Uh, Ken Blanchard once said that uh, the word ego, you've heard the word ego before, right? Yeah. Ego can stand for edging God out. And that's what pride does, isn't it? We edge God out, take over. We take more control. We take more things ourselves. That's what pride is, selfishness. Uh, but pride and kindness are not compatible. And so Blanchard says that ego can also stand for exalting God only. Hmm. That's the goal for us. Which one best describes you? Edging God out or exalting God only. And as we submit to God and we say, Lord, uh, you know, I might feel that I have a right to act or to speak in a certain situation, but Lord, I, I choose your way instead. I, I choose the words that you supply me instead. God will bless that. And we can surrender our lives, not just part of the time, but all of the time. You know, Pastor Bill Hybels once asked his congregation, um, how much in God's eyes is 95% commitment to God? And then he answered it, not enough. Not enough. 95% commitment would be good to most people, but not enough to God. We, we can follow him 95% of the time and yet still miss out. Think about the rich young ruler. He came to Jesus and he said, good teacher, I've done all of these things. And Jesus said, one thing you still lack. We can miss out. After all, the song isn't, I surrender most of the time. It's, I surrender all. Yeah, 100% commitment. So if we're going to experience and we're going to live out this kindness to die to self, uh, to be a part of the family of God, to trust God's um, grace in those times of pressure and difficulty, and to submit to God. You never know where an act of kindness can be used by God. He can use it in ways that you can never imagine. Pastor Don Wilton, who now and for many years has been the pastor of the Southern Baptist Church and Spartanburg, South Carolina, he told the story of when he was in seminary in New Orleans, Southern Baptist Seminary in New Orleans. He said one night, uh, so, you know, the wife was home, they had a couple of small children, uh, she sent him to the grocery store. And it was kind of later at night and some of the main stores were closed, but it was kind of a convenience grocery type store that was open on the corner down the street from where they were living. And he went in and, and when he was in the uh, store, he saw this young couple 
Long, stringy hair, dirty, didn't look like they had bathed, could smell them an aisle away. Saw that they were very dis uh, distraught and troubled about something. And as they murmured to each other, uh, there came a moment when uh, the young lady walked off to another part of the store. Don says, I, I walked up behind him, having been moved by God to do something, didn't have much, reached into my pockets. All I had was a $5 bill. Now, this was back probably in the 70s, so $5 went a little bit further. He said, I walked up behind the man and I stuck it in his back and I said, don't turn around. Now, even to this day, if you're living in New Orleans and somebody comes up and sticks something in your back and says, don't turn around, that might be kind of a frightening experience. Don says, I went on to say, I said, the Lord has put this on my heart to give this money to you, but I don't want you to know who I am. So please just take this money and wait until I've walked away before you turn around. And the young man did that. Don went on his way, never thought uh, much of it after that. Two months later, Don was preaching in one of the churches in the New Orleans area, and he stepped forward to offer the invitation. And a young, well-dressed couple uh, came out into the aisle and marched forward very quickly. As they came up to him, he recognized them. Here they were all cleaned up and big smiles on their face. And they reached out a hand and they said, uh, Brother Don, we just want you to know that we've given our lives to Jesus. In fact, we believe he's calling us to the mission field. And we're looking for ways to become a part of the Southern Baptist Seminary in New Orleans. But there's more to the story that we want to tell you. That night that you gave us that gift, this is what was happening. So my wife and I, we have a four-year-old child. And we had been evicted from the place where we were living. We had no family, no place to go. And we had among us just a handful of change, not even a dollar's worth. We were without job, without hope, didn't know where to turn, and this was before they come to know the Lord. I said, we, we pulled into a parking lot near a convenience store on the corner, and there was in our hands this change, our four-year-old in the back seat, and a three fifty seven Magnum sitting between us on the front seat with three bullets, one for each of us. We talked about how we were going to end our lives, and we decided this. We decided that no child should die on an empty stomach, and so we took the little bit of coins that we had and walked into that store to buy her last meal. As I walked in, the man said, I prayed to God, and I said, Lord, if, God, if you're real, would you show yourself to us before we do this deed? Walked into the store, we didn't even have enough for much more than a loaf of bread. And a man stuck something in my back and said, God has put this on my heart to give it to you. Five dollars in the 1970s was enough to provide a meal for that whole family that night. And God got a hold of their hearts and they found Christian believers, came to know the Lord. They went on and have now served over 30 years as Southern Baptist missionaries somewhere overseas because of an act of kindness that God put on his heart. And they found him. If you knew Pastor Don, his accent, there's only one in the whole wide world. They tracked him down in that city and they told him what had happened. You never know how God can use an act of kindness to bless somebody else. Lord, thank you for your word this morning.